Soteriology is one of those big words in academia. But it's really just, a, it's about our salvation. How are we saved? Um, last week, we talked about salvation as being in several parts of justification, sanctification, and glorification. And we talked about justification as that one time entering into this covenant relationship with God. Um, and then we're called to grow. And sanctification is that growing in this relationship. And then glorification is what we look forward to. Um, for some of the saints, they almost were living in the kingdom before their death. And after their death, sometimes ne never really left the world behind them. Um, the boundaries got conf get confused at times. But sanctification is this process of becoming holy. In some ways, it can be considered nothing more than learning how to love. In 1 John 4, we're, taught, we're told to be working out perfect love. That, in essence, is what sanctification is. We enter into the covenant individually by an individual decision. But we can't be saved, sanctified, without other people. We can only be saved as the body of Christ. Because you can't go off by yourself in the middle of nowhere and learn love. Love for most of us requires other people to be interacting with. Um, Dorotheos of Gaza, one of the great early fathers, he has an illustration of an old spoke wagon wheel where God is the hub in the center and we're out on the rim. And it's only as we sort of follow the spokes and come inward getting closer to God and learning to, to know God and to love God, but to do that, the spokes have to come closer and closer together. If we don't want to get close to other people, if we don't want to love other people, we're not going to be able to love God. Sanctification. Last week I talked a little bit about sort of the stair step type of analogy. Um, I want to carry that out a little bit further and look at sort of five steps. The first step is the overcoming of death. What Christ has done to die to defeat death. As we say at Pascha, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the grave, bestowing life. That is a salvation that God offers to all people. No one disappears. No one ceases to exist. There is no annihilation. We'll all live forever. And then there's justification, where I personally appropriate that work of Christ. I'm baptized, I'm adopted as a child of God, I come to faith, there's these many different terms for it, but it's that one time change of myself and my relationship with God. Parallel to the Old Testament where the Jewish people were circumcised to become part of the covenant, entering into that covenant relationship with God. It's on that foundation that we build our sanctification. And sanctification can be looked at as three more steps on top of it. The first step is called practice. And practice is a negative and a positive. Those things we are putting away and those things we are acquiring. Then on top of that is what's called illumination. Illumination, the Mount of Transfiguration. The apostles enter into this cloud of light. Paul on the road to Damascus, this light comes down upon him. This is illumination. In the technical language of the church, they talk about the uncreated light of God. 
that there is a light of God in the same way as in the Old Testament and Moses, the pillar of fire at night. This light of God comes down and people actually see and enter into that light. Some people experience this once, other people continue can experience it over and over again. It's not a magic, it's not a, it's not something we can control. It's always a gift, it's a grace of God that he get of his giving himself to people. But it's something that the saints experience. And then there is, after illumination, enlightenment. The truly knowing God. The saints who talk to God. The saints who have that intimate relationship. The same as the Old Testament. Moses was the friend of God. Moses is the one who walked with God. You have all the way through. This is nothing that the church is inventing as some sort of new experience. It's an experience that's always been there in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and on through the history of this church. This, this illumination and enlightenment of knowing God, not just contemplating the idea, but a personal relationship. It's not uncommon, but it is rare. Some people say that maybe a dozen people in any lifetime experience this in the world. Um, it's not the thing that most of us are going to go home and encounter. But who knows? For most of us, the praxis is where we're going to spend our whole lives. If you've ever read um, Bunyan's Pilgrim Progr Pilgrim's Progress, or the old medieval concepts of the virtues and the vices, seven deadly sins, um, pride, lust, anger, avarice, all these classic terms that the church has had for a long time. This is what they're talking about, of putting away those characteristics of our fallen nature that are opposed to, opposite of God, and working and acquiring the positive virtues, love, chastity, charity, patience, kindness. There is no fixed list to this. And you'll find, um, find different elders approaching things differently. Of Some people focus very much um, on how to overcome the negative things. Uh, one elder I was talking, I've, I've heard talking, sees anger as being the primary thing. Of how many of us, somebody cuts us off in traffic, somebody slights us for something, and we get angry. And anger is a difficult thing to handle. A lot of times there's some people who are just always simmering with anger. But they may say, oh, it's better for me to be angry interior than to go beat somebody. At least I'm not hurting them. But they're killing themselves. That's what these passions do. They literally kill us and separate us from God. They are things, they're not how God made us to be. They're things that, as I said last week, death creates fear. And fear leads us into sin, which leads us further into death. I get angry because somebody did something that inconveniences me. I think it hurts me. But the fathers say over and over again, we can only hurt ourselves. If we have patience and we have love, no one can hurt us. This is the story of the martyrs. That even in death, they're saying no one can ultimately hurt me because Christ has overcome death. Father Seraph, um, Seraph of Medidis, the um, abbot of the monastery in Mole in, in Scotland, um, 
he takes a slightly different approach. He says, forget the negative. Focus on the positive things. Focus on love. To him, it is sort of like <clears throat> if you have a, a cup or a bucket or something that has a lot of water in it, you can spend your time emptying the bucket and you end up with an empty bucket. But if you fill the bucket up with olive oil, the water will rise up and spill out. That if you focus on the positive things, they will replace the negative. This is what the Orthodox spiritual life calls us to. This is all the practices of fasting, the ascetical efforts we talk about are to put off the negative and acquire the virtues. Um, Father Schmemann, he talks, what is the purpose of fasting? To be hungry. We don't recognize how much we say, I want, until we say no to ourselves. It's only when we say no to eating whenever I want that I realize what it's like to be hungry and how much of my life is driven by my wants, what I want, satisfying myself rather than loving for caring for others. It's not that we should starve ourselves to death and there's virtue in just starving. But we don't recognize how much we're caught up in our own passions until we're willing to say no to them. Until we're willing to say no to Facebook or YouTube and realize how addicted we get to our phones, how addicted we get to so many things in life. And that's what this practice is calling us to do, is to find and work out all those things that keep us from knowing how to love as Christ has loved. And it could be boring, painful, difficult. Um, in the Desert Fathers, there's a story of Abba Pombo, who's this abbot of a monastery, a holy man, but he's getting a little crisp right around the edges, I think, taking care of all these other monks and he goes to one of the other elders and says, what more can I do? I fast regularly. I have my routine of prayers. What more is there? And the elder holds up his hands and there are flames coming off the end of his fingers. And he says, if I was really holy, my whole self would be one flame. This is the possibility of what the church says we could come to. It's not easy. Of you, you read the lives of Elder Joseph, the Hesychist. He was a, a monk on Mount Athos who basically ended up reviving monasticism on Mount Athos. He spent 40 years struggling with the passions, disciplining himself before he encountered illumination. There are people who spend their whole lifetimes struggling. And it's not if you don't achieve this, forget it, you haven't made it. Um, there are those who never know what holiness they've achieved until after they die. So it's not one of these things of, here's a rule, if you haven't gotten to here, forget it. Um, St. Anthony the Great, one of the early desert monastics, someone who truly knew God and talked to God. 
but he also got a little full of himself occasionally. There's a point where he, he asks God, who else has the holiness that I have? God comes along and says, go into the city. There's a circus here. And you need to see this one actor in the circus. In those days, this, the church would not accept anybody as a catechumen who worked in the circus. It was considered totally debauched, immoral, horrible. So for St. Anthony to be told, go and visit someone who works in the circus, is like, it, this is crazy. And he goes and he finds this person. And they're giving away most of their income. At night, they're going out and taking care of the poor. And Anthony realizes that I'm sitting out here in the desert with my prayers and my date tree. And what am I doing in comparison to him? Anthony doesn't quite learn the lesson completely because two more times God sends him out. He asks God, who is like this? Who has my holiness? And he sends him out to a merchant. And the merchant, the person in the circus, they did not see themselves as holy. They saw themselves as struggling in the world, doing what they could and what they thought they could, was their best effort. And they never experienced illumination or enlightenment. But God says, this is holiness. These things are gifts that God gives to the church, not just to the individual, as evidence of the reality and the presence of God, as people who can, from that experience, teach others what God is like and how they too can know God. But there's a danger of it becoming a, I want, because I, gee, I want, I want to achieve this, scout badge sort of thing. Rather than seeing it as it's a gift that God gives those who need the gift to grow and strengthen the church as a whole. This is the goal, this is the salvation that the church asks us to strive for. We're justified, our sins are forgiven. But I like sort of the medical model that it's like I am sickened to death with a virus of my sins. And God comes along and eliminates that virus in my body. He cures me, but now like anyone who has been ill with a severe illness. There has to be recovery. I, to stop being ill does not mean I'm healthy. What God is calling us to is health, a restoration. And that restoration takes physical therapy. It takes effort. And we have to put that into it in order to achieve this love, this likeness of Christ that we're called to. In many ways, this is a restoration, as I said before, being restored to that state that Adam and Eve had in the garden with God. To set us on a path of the glorification of where we're going to be going into the future. It is becoming like Christ. Very much it is, it's a union with Christ. In the Gospel of John, Jesus prays that they may be one as we are one. There's a unity within the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, a relationship of love amongst them. And God is calling us into that relationship. Not that we become another God, 
but by grace we can enter into that relationship of love but we need to struggle ourselves to learn that love through through our prayers through our attending services through the charity work that we do through learning patience and kindness with each other There's a great little book called The Deification as the Purpose of Man's Life. Um, it's out on the Greek Orthodox website. You don't have to buy it, you can download it and read it. It's, it's, it's pretty short. Um, back in 2000, I, I went to Mount Athos with a couple other people. And um, it was at St. Paul's Monastery, and we were waiting for the ferry to get us back off or to get to the next monastery. And there's this bookstore. I saw, this, saw a copy of this sitting in there, and, and I was looking for some good books, and this one, it, it really caught my eye. But the fairy came, and there was nobody in the bookstore, so I couldn't get it. And it was wandering around through Thessalonica as we were leaving, and stopped by a bookstore, and I found a copy of it. I almost want to say it was the best part of my whole trip to Mount Athos. Of, it really gave me the understanding of what it is to live the Orthodox Christian life. And while the Orthodox Church, um, we probably have the most detailed medical books on this, the latter divine ascent is nothing more than talking about this praxis and this development. This is something that is not unique to orthodoxy. You look at Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and he's talking the same thing, a pilgrim who goes through the gate, the narrow gate, and then starts this journey onto the Holy Land. He's talking here about sanctification. This is a common theme that all Christians share but I think orthodoxy emphasizes it to a degree much stronger than almost anyone else. I'll sort of leave it with that for the moment. Um, a little bit of time, I, I said last week, that would deal a little bit with the issue of judgment. Because at that point, sort of between the end of sanctification and glorification, there's a judgment that all of us will deal with. Different people will lean to things different ways. So I'm giving you one of the acceptable views within the church. If you hear somebody going in a different direction, um, it's not that they're wrong, I'm right, or whatever. Um, you can get some orthodox, I mean, do some pretty good hellfire and damnation sermons occasionally. Um, but orthodoxy tends to lean against that. The classic one is Jonathan Edwards, sinner in the hands of an angry, or, yeah, um, sinner in the hands of an angry God, um, a good Puritan preacher in the early American period. And the tendency of judgment is to think of this angry God who's got this list of everything you've done and now I'm gonna get you for it. All the cartoons you see of this big judge's bench with this gray-haired old man sitting over and looking down at someone. Judgment in orthodoxy and what we find in the New Testament can sometimes be more vindication of God judging that I am judging that you were in the right. This is what the resurrection is, in part. You look at Jesus. He's rejected by the Jews, condemned by the Romans. In almost every way you look at him, he's a failure. He's rejected, he's murdered unjustly. And the resurrection, in no sense, is the vindication of God saying, 
he was in the right, and they're not. That is, in a sense, what we can look forward to if we are finding ourselves in Christ. Of God who is going to vindicate us, the saints, the martyrs who have died, without the glory as St. Isaac today. Of a vindication that this faith, this struggle that seems to have gone nowhere in the eyes of the world, are the ones that God's calling out as being truly justified by their faith. There's this idea that in orthodoxy that I like, that God is a consuming fire. And it is the love of God that is the judgment. You find this in many places of um, the burning bush that's not consumed. You find this in the, th in the book of Daniel, the three youths in the fiery furnace who are being judged by fire, or so the king thinks. But they're walking around as if it is a cool breeze blowing in there for them. In 1 Corinthians, there's a passage that talks about we will all be judged by fire. The wood, hay, and the stubble will be burned up. The gold, the silver, and the precious jewels, they'll be refined, purified. It is not the fire of God who, you know, the, the cartoons of the little demons with their pitchforks and the flaming pitch, torturing people. But this is the love of God that will remove and get rid of those things, these vices that we're talking about, that if we hold on to them, and if my pride, I should, probably shouldn't say this, not necessarily politically correct, but I look at politicians like Donald Trump and the arrogance, the pride, the grasping on material accumulation of wealth or claiming to have this amount of wealth. And he's not the only one. But he sees this almost like his identity. How he identifies himself and what his value and worth is. What's it going to be like for someone like that when all that is stripped away from them? It's going to feel like their whole person is being just shredded. That's why we go to confession, to say that these things that I find within myself are not me. That which is not like God, I reject. So that way, when we come into the presence of God, I'm not clinging on to them. I've already let go of them. And the fire is only a refinement to make me glow in the precious virtues that I've acquired. This to me is a much better, I think, metaphor of judgment than we often get. In part because it is not something that God can change. It's not if God was more loving and more merciful, he wouldn't do this is precisely because he is who he is as a loving person. That it's my choice of what I hold on to when I, want, when I come before him that makes the difference, that is the judgment. There's a tradition in the church, if you get to Matins, there's a series of Psalms that are read at the beginning of the Matins service. They take about 15 or 16 minutes. And one tradition is these are the psalms that will be read at the judgment. And the judgment will take no longer than that. That it is not God who's going to sit back and get a checklist, but it's we ourselves who will judge ourselves. 
I, I think of some of the saints, like Seraphim the Sarov, who in his life, people see him walking three feet off the ground as he prays, walking around the monastery at night. He talks to God, to, the Theo, to Christ, to the Theotokos, as he talks to all the other people in the monastery. The boundary between him and the kingdom just fades out. And after he dies, he still comes and talks to people. Death is overcome. It's a restoration to what God has called us to be as human beings and wants us to be. It's the restoration and reconciliation of the kingdom on earth and the kingdom of heaven coming together into this new state. This is what the Orthodox Church is calling us into. A, a grand adventure that um, will have no end. But today is our beginning. What are we doing? Questions? Thoughts? Ross? So for these rare few individuals who experience illumination in this life before the repose, mm -hmm. does that imply anything for their sort of um, eternal experience of God in the next life? Or are they just experiencing something a little bit sooner than the, than the rest of us will? I tend to think of it more in that latter point, that they are experiencing that future in the present. Yeah, how future, how well, that's going to be, I don't know. Um, there will be differences, what it's going to be. There's a part of where some people see this as something that will continue for all eternity, is growing closer and closer to God. It's not just a stops here, wherever you were at this point, that's it. But it'll be an eternal growing. Um, so start from there. You're contemplating. As the economist place, I was taking on my graduate school work in theosis studies. That's very powerful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just very nice to hear that again. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, I actually got some handouts. Of. I'll leave them up here. This one is more of a, sort of a summary of where I see a difference of Eastern and Western views of things. Um, the difference of paradigms, the difference in our theology and how we do theology. <clears throat> and this one is one I did um, more particularly on sanctification. And it gets into a little bit of um, more details. Technical language. You may have heard of the word noose mm -hmm. and some of that. This covers sort of what's the noose, how are we tempted, and how what's sort of the mechanics of how some of this works. So uh, I'll leave these up here. Yeah.